Is that going now? There we go. Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 152 of Live at the Hive. My name is Dan Nadelko. Uh, Matt Finich. I'm Sachito. Excellent. On episode 152, today we are talking Ooh. about how to turn your shopping browsers into buyers and obviously loyal customers. Yeah, for sure. We've been kind of on this train for, you know, holiday spending, uh, holiday campaigns and stuff. And, you know, it's really important. And, you know, this week we're going to be giving you a little bit more tips on, uh, you know, how to convert those uh, visitors on your website, uh, existing customers, um, with a number of different ways. So definitely some really good stuff to kind of pack in here before uh, you finalize your holiday campaigns. Absolutely. And like we talked about last week, it is holiday campaign planning time. So if you haven't started, please do start. Hello, Stacy. Yep. Hello, Mate. Hello, Chad, Miguel, Yvonne. Hey, Bees. What's going hey, on? They're all flooding in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Definitely. Um, yes. So today we're going to we're going to go through a bit of a journey from from the very beginning of understanding who your customer is, mm -hmm. kind of walking through different techniques you can use uh, to to create that engagement and build that relationship right up from how you get the leads into your store in the first place yep. or into your website in the first place and different tools you can use and tactics you can use to create that engagement and get them um, and, and really get those individuals engaged properly uh, and you know, cost effectively mm -hmm. being a, a very important part of that whole thing. Absolutely. Cool. Absolutely. So Already. Here, so, so I'm going to, um, let's start off with uh, the infographic, Dan, uh, for not the infographic, the lucid chart. And then what we can do is as we kind of go through each section, we can kind of break it down and introduce some of the other articles uh, that we have uh, on deck. Sure. That sounds good. Cool. Alrighty. So, okay. So, you know, there's, it, several ways to to create um interest brand awareness you know basically gaining attention um on social media for your business during a busy time uh -huh. and this is one of the key kind of high level roadmaps that we've used several several times we know it's effective it works pretty much every time when done properly um and what it involves is the concept of a lead magnet and a trip wire um, those are the two initial starting points. Now, right at the very top there, you'll see selecting a traffic source. Mm -hmm. Now, when you're selecting a traffic source, there are some opportunities within each of these platforms. And we're going to talk more. We'll dig into exactly how you do this. Um, mm -hmm. But social advertising is extremely powerful. Um, Sashida, you've been running dozens and dozens of campaigns over the last little while. Um, I would say Facebook is continues to be uh, incredibly effective and low cost. Yeah. Right on. And so, you know, if you look at Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, those three are really huge opportunities. And, and one of the reasons that they're huge opportunities, and we're going to talk a bit about this later, is the ability to create audiences, mm -hmm. custom audiences, yep. and lookalike audiences. And done properly, we just had an example this week of one we did where we did a hyper target mm -hmm. um, where our cost per engagement was one penny. Yeah. Wow. That's and, crazy. You know, yeah. um, Facebook has a substantial amount of data on on all of us in terms of who we mm -hmm. are and, and what we're looking for. So when you use those interests and other aligning interests, you can really get a low cost per click, like incredibly low cost and incredibly yep. accurate. So sure. when we select the traffic sources, you, you do have a number of other options as well. Email marketing in SMS are two of the most effective. Email marketing is still kind of rules uh, in terms of its effectiveness. So having that email list and nurturing that email list is extremely critical, just as critical as creating audiences and nurturing your audiences on Facebook Business Manager to run your low cost. I'm talking 25, 50, 75 dollar mm -hmm. pilot tests, uh, so mm -hmm. you can actually get conversions. Yep. Um, so we've got to select the right traffic sources, and then what we want to do in the next step is offer a lead magnet. And what a lead magnet is is really just a high value 
inf typically informational offer, but a high value offer without even trying at this point, we're not even trying to make any money yet. We're just mm -hmm. trying to get that individual engaged, knowing who we are and seeing yep. something that's almost an irresistible or, or a very high value offer. Exactly. Yeah. It's that, it's that mentality where it's like, you, you, you say it all the time. It's like, you're not asking someone on the first date to marry you type thing, right? You're trying to generate <laughs> yep. that, you know, that awareness, you're trying to generate, you know, a little bit of activity and interest in your, uh, in, in your product. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And so uh, a high value uh, offer lead magnet would include um, valuable checklists or information for people. Mm -hmm. You could also do at this point is if you're selling a physical product, um, you can offer a free sample uh, size. All they have to do is pay shipping. That's a, that's another lead magnet. It's something really that is designed and we're going to talk a bit about how you define the persona of an individual and really understand your your target customer but when you understand the pain points of your customer you understand you will understand that you know if you're in the the health and wellness or fitness space maybe it's a 30 day mindfulness health wellness exercise calendar right to get them started for free something they really want the whole goal there is to get their contact information and to build that relationship then moving down to the next step, once we're able to do that, we offer what's called a tripwire. And a tripwire isn't magic. You all know what it is. You've seen it a million times. Well, uh, <laughs> Prime Day. Yeah. Prime right. Day is one gigantic, mm -hmm. gigantic tripwire. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which is, Absolutely. you know, that I don't, I actually don't buy on Prime Days um, <clears throat> personally, but um You'll see it. Uh, Best Buy does it very effectively as well all the time. It's the two hundred and ninety nine dollar fifty two inch TV limited <laughs> supply. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and what it is is so when Best Buy and Amazon do this and we can take a lot of lessons from the billions that they spend in, in and literally Amazon spends billions of in dollars of, of customer research, conversion rate optimization research. So when you see Amazon doing something, you can take a cue from them. And they will absolutely give you, uh, you can save all that money by really mimicking a lot of the techniques that they're putting mm -hmm. in place. Mm -hmm. So we want to offer that that tripwire product. And that's something where you, you really don't want to make any money at this point yet. You just, because one of the key things, especially in e-commerce, is whenever there's an ROI and you have a cost per acquisition using a Facebook or Google or Microsoft or Bing or whatever it might be, is the ROI will probably not be positive until you can attribute a second, a third, a fourth, and hopefully a fifth sale, right? Because every time you're able to capture that customer on their first purchase, you have an ROI. So let's say let's say your, your net profit is $14 and your cost per acquisition there was $5, right? You're going to net out at $9 in uh, ROAS return on advertising spend. Mm -hmm. But if that person purchases again, right, then you still attribute that to the investment in the advertising campaign, mm -hmm. but your return on advertising spend is now going to double and then it's going to double again. And not to mention which you will have a lifelong customer, hopefully, right? Or at least a repeat <laughs> that's customer. Yep, yeah, that's the goal, right? For right? sure. Mm -hmm. So that's the entire goal. So that tripwire opens that up and it it, it, there is also a psychology around people simply opening up a funding source, whether it's a credit card or a wallet. That's a big psychological barrier of trust for people. So if once someone has made a purchase, even if it's a dollar, right, mm -hmm. they've crossed that psychological barrier of doing business with you. Right. And that's a very important part. So on the left, uh, right side, sorry, of this infographic, you'll see the follow up series and, and using email to really tell a story and to develop a relationship with that individual while they're in that part of the cadence. Yep. Right. It's not just offer, offer, offer blindly conversation that happens there. When we get to the third stage, we're able to offer our core product, which is the thing we really want to sell. Um, we we have two options. If they don't go into the, uh, the take advantage of the first core offer, don't let that just fall away. 
put them back into a sequence and we want to follow up either sweetening the offer by upselling yep. or by discounting at that point and asking them maybe why they, you know, mm -hmm. why they didn't. You can learn more. Yeah, absolutely. And we talked a bit about that last week with uh, open carts, right? So, you know, mm -hmm. um, maybe if someone uh, has left something in their cart, they've been in their cart. Um, I mean, that's not the end of your transaction or your relationship with that person, right? Sweeten up the deal, like Dan just said, maybe send them a discount offer and be like, hey, we noticed that you have blank in your um, in your in your cart. Here's like maybe an extra 20 or free shipping or whatever you want to sweeten the deal, right? And mm -hmm. As you kind of do that and offer more of like an upsell, uh, you'll increase the chances. And I think we actually put a number on it last week. I think it was like 30% or something like that of increased sales with a, an abandoned cart feature. Yeah, that's on, on average. You can increase yeah. yourself by 30% with a strong Very powerful. product upsell feature. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, absolutely. And then, and then in the last stage there, once a core product is purchased, always have an upsell or a cross sell. Mm -hmm. They're called upsells or cross sells. So you see this absolutely as well all the time. Amazon does it quite a bit. You know, people who bought this also bought these items together and they create mm -hmm. bundles on the fly for people. Yep. So, so for example, if you're selling jewelry, maybe there's a bracelet that would work well with it, mm -hmm. right? That's a great cross sell because you're catching that person at that point when they've They've, they've made that purchase, they're excited about their purchase, and then right at that point is the right time to offer that upsell. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And even if you have, maybe you have a variety of products and it's more of like a niche market, right? And mm -hmm. maybe you offer maybe startup pack packages where, you know, maybe someone could pick and choose here and there what they want. But if you recommend a whole package deal, like this is your starter kit, um, that, that, that's an awesome way to kind of bundle things up and, and kind of get, get a little bit more kind of upsell going on in your stores for sure. For and sure. it could be temporary products too. Like it doesn't have to be season long. These could be things that you get set up, uh, specifically for these kind of trip wire, um, mm -hmm. uh, events. Well, yeah, actually. And, and what you see with a lot of, especially merchandise retailers, uh, on e-commerce are what are called drops. Um, Drops are not new in the world of e-commerce. They absolutely are not. Um, there's a clothing retailer uh, you may or may not be familiar with called Aritzia. Mm -hmm. um, and Aritzia was famous back in the day. I'm not sure what their current status is given all of the issues around in the world. But they became quite well known for having one type of clothing. And once it was gone, it was gone. Like they wouldn't bring it back, right? Yep. So they created a sense of FOMO in their audience. And we're going to talk about that, that if I don't buy this now, I may never get it again. Yep. Right. And those limited time drops or offers are a fantastic way to build up that energy and that excitement around all of these processes. For sure. Absolutely. And, you know, especially if it's a product that's gaining a lot of, you know, traction and engagement mm -hmm. on your social social media pages as well. Um, maybe you could do something special where for a limited time you get this product and uh, one of the fan favorites for um, a bundle price, right? So definitely a lot of stuff to kind of play around with there. I mean, a lot of things like you could maybe try one on, uh, on a one-off and it doesn't work and maybe switch around. So you, you definitely need to play around with them a little bit and really get into your customer's head on yeah. what, what products they need and maybe uh, which products are, are the best sellers that uh, people usually buy together. And, you know, if, if you mm -hmm. set up your online store correctly, uh, especially with Shopify and some of the other uh, big e-commerce platforms, they can actually mm -hmm. give you a lot of that information that so you don't have to go digging for it. So it's really yeah. right there for the taking, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, and the other thing I want to I want to kind of reinforce here is that although we're using technology and and you know whether it's any by the way this also works for lead gen like yeah. it works for any kind of a customer whether you're SaaS um, mm -hmm. software supplier or B two B you're looking to bet generate B two B leads these customer journeys work across yep. the board um, for that. So if we just jump back to the to the infographic that mm -hmm. we have there. Um, and then in the final start and the final part here, and this is really, really important. And this is the old, uh, if you're in Canada, Rogers and Bell never treat their existing customers as well as they treat their new customers. Um, yep. Yeah. Um, create a return path. That includes putting them into a new email marketing sequence 
It includes creating those custom audiences and retargeting groups or remarketing groups on Google um, and using social media to continually engage with your audience, mm -hmm. right? Don't forget about them because the gold in your business, the way that you're going to grow is by retaining and upselling your existing customers and building that super loyal, super dedicated fan base. The mm -hmm. nth extreme of that is Apple, right? Apple has managed to do this for years, um, especially in recent years. You could argue wildly overpriced um, in many ways. Lock in. You can't upgrade a lot of their their stuff, um, but they have such a rabidly loyal fan base that they manage to continually offer um, new products to. Uh, uh, I mean, what was it? Just the uh, iPhone 12 was yeah. just the other day, right? Yeah. When did they release the 11? I don't think it was a year yet. It's like <laughs> half a year for the uh, updated series. Yeah, it's nuts. Yeah, something crazy like that. By the time you sure. buy that phone, they announce a new one. And it's like, what the hell? <laughs> yep. <laughs> you are already out of date the minute you purchase yep, it. Pretty well. But yeah, for I mean, for return paths too, uh, in terms of kind of email marketing, um, you know, when, when you get like maybe a customer to sign up for, you know, um, recurrent emails for promotion, special offers. A lot of the times, like maybe send an email, like right after they purchase something, be like, Hey, like really pre appreciate it. Hope you find everything uh, great. Uh, if you have an issue, please let us know. If you like it, leave a review and then maybe give them an offer for next time too, because mm -hmm. then they're more eager to, you know, well, Hey, I just bought something and they just emailed me and I already got like 10% off or 20% off my next, my next order. Like, they're going to be opening up your campaigns more and more, right? And then you can start kind of filtering them, segmenting them. So it's really important to kind of make sure. And it goes along with all five of these um, uh, pathways for sure. But, you know, mm -hmm. think about creative ways that you can get people a little bit more engaged, spark their interest. Well, the other the other thing that I would so strongly suggest and, and everything um, kind of circles back to what was true back in the day is still true. Mm -hmm. is, you know, the most powerful thing, Steve Jobs said this, is the most powerful talent is the ability to be a storyteller. In, and it's true. Um, yeah. What you want to do, I think, after post-purchase is go beyond the simple sale, right? Mm -hmm. Talk about how they're going to use that, how that product's going to make their life better. Put them into other types of sequences that are not related to your actual product, but how they the, your product fits into the solution they're trying to find. Yep. Um, it's a hugely powerful way of going about it. Okay. So, so let's jump back a step now. Mm -hmm. And maybe we should talk a little bit about understanding your customer. Um, For sure. And this really comes down to persona development. Um, and how do you develop a persona and understand what your customer, you know, who is your customer? What are their philosophies? What are their pain points? What are they trying to achieve? It goes way beyond a simple demographic. It goes deep, more deeply into the psychology of their needs mm -hmm. and what they want and how your product will solve their problems or make their lives better. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, look, um, beforehand, uh, before COVID, I think, yeah, um, you know, your, your demographic and your target audience, they're, they're pretty solidified, right? Because there wasn't any uncertainty with the economy, people losing their jobs and things like that. But I think right now it's a really good time to maybe reassess your customer and your, and your demographic, right? Um, mm -hmm. People's lives have changed dramatically. And, uh, you know, if, if, if your demographic is, is part of the, uh, I guess you could say population that have been struggling with COVID, um, you know, their products that maybe um, they bought it a lot more frequently, but now because of COVID, you've seen kind of the repurchase uh, percentage kind of dwindle, right? So it, maybe it's some, maybe it's a great time to kind of reassess that and, and do a little bit more persona work before you really dive into these campaigns. And that's really what understanding your customer is. It's, 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 it's ever changing, right? Getting into their heads mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, let me just, uh, I'm going to pop that one into, oops, not that one. Oh, Stacy okay. said something here. Right. Stacy says, love storytelling. It's a great way to build an authentic relationship with your customers. A relationship uh, like that will help build a customer base that will advocate for you and most likely repeat purchases. Absolutely true. For yep. sure. We can, and you know what? You can hire an agency like us to help with your, with a, with your, 
persona development, but there's nothing stopping yep. you from sitting down. Um, and if you check, I just threw up a sample persona there, Matt. Yep. Let's throw it up. Okay, so this is an example of a persona development minus the super cheesy clip art that's in there. But <laughs> ignore that. Let's let's not talk about that. Yep. Right yep. So if you look at it, you see his personal profile. He's got statements of belief, what he's looking for, mm -hmm. where he browses on the internet, his total background, his attributes, you know, product content needs, what what he's looking for, where the, the type of media mix that he might consume. And you can do this through a really good way to learn about this stuff. We actually did this with a client some time ago and we had thousands of responses and the client was in the cheese business. Um, and it was, um, it was uh, di uh, not diabetic. What is it? Uh, lactose uh, intolerant, friendly cheese. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and what ended up coming out of surveying people that were visiting the, the website was the vast majority of their purchasers online were in fact there because they were lactose intolerant and had sensitive digestion. Um, that was not what the, the feeling was from that group. So you can learn a lot by simple little micro, um, micro surveys, right? Mm -hmm. um, instead of sending a gigantic survey out, um, you can progressively profile people and really start to learn to build out this persona. But the key here, the key is absolutely this is the most critical part of the entire process, because if you don't understand who you're talking to or what how you should be speaking to people and what their problem is, typically what ends up happening is you start talking about yourself, which as marketers, we don't want to talk about ourselves. We want to talk about our customers and how we make their lives better. Right. Yep. Cool. Absolutely. All right. Next up on the hit parade. So now when we understand our customer, we kind of started talking about it. We really want to start mapping a strong customer journey. Um, map it out on a piece of paper, boxes and arrows. What happens after they purchase? What's the message that you're going to send them? Right. Uh -huh. What happens when they receive their product or their sign up? Are they properly onboarded? Are you following up in three days with a you know, how's everything going? I just wanted to check uh -huh. in to see that that everything is working well. And are you collecting those responses? And then what are those follow on sequences? How do you keep them engaged and build that yep. community? Um, so we're going to I think we might actually have some of this. We've got we've got a dearth of videos <laughs> or videos, <laughs> articles kind of all over the place here. Yeah, um, I have this one here that I think we would be good. Let's see. I think uh, one of the bees put it in here. Let's see. Uh, let's... All right. Man, they put a lot in here this week. Let's yeah, do that's... this one. Uh, where's my screen share here? Okay. There we go. So this is kind of this article. It talks more about, you know, how to convert online uh browsers into buyers, but mm -hmm. uh, a lot of these tips can actually be used to help uh, create that customer journey. And some of these tips are, are quite essential within that journey. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we can kind of start uh, right here. Number one is kind of let your product shine, right? So again, at the very start of the journey, you almost want to position your products where it's more of an awareness type, right? Gather people's interests, start bringing them in a little bit story, maybe behind your brand, things like that. Like we said before, no, no marriage proposals on the first date. Right. Um, so that's definitely going to be the first step. Yep. And I think, I think one of the things to keep in mind and what we're talking about here, we're going to, we're going to dive into, um, uh, dive into some of the ways you're going to acquire the customer. Mm -hmm. But the important part is to understand what their journey is, is, is going to be and mm -hmm. start with, giving more than you're asking. So that's the old jab, 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 right hook, right? All mm -hmm. the jobs are, I'm going to give you this. I'm going to give you this piece of content. I'm going to give you this offer. I'm going to offer to help you. Um, mm -hmm. Just as an example, um, one of the things, and you could use, I'll use the jewelry example as well. Why not provide a series of uh, outfit consultations that go along with your jewelry? 
right? So what outfits look good with this jewelry? Where would you wear it? Is this for work? Is this casual? Um, is it for, you know, what's the context of it? Um, and that's part of that, that, that journey, that customer journey process. And it's, uh, it's, you know, it's definitely top of mind for for women that are in the jewelry market and even men that are in the in the uh, jewelry market for sure. Absolutely, for sure. Um, I just uh, brought up this uh, article by HubSpot. They have some really cool kind of customer template um, maps that uh, you, some of the viewers for the live can actually use uh, for their holiday campaigns. Uh, <laughs> let me see here. Yeah, and for sure. And I'm going to pull up actually the customer journey map that IKEA put together, which is I think one of the most interesting that I've seen. Yep, for sure. Um, so we can kind of see here um, while Dan's pulling that up, we can kind of see, you know, the, the different awareness stages of the customer journey, right? right? So kind of like we said, the awareness, consideration, decision, and it, it really follows, you know, the model that we keep talking about where it's kind of the see, think, do, care model, right? Mm -hmm. um, for sure. So that's kind of like, what are your customers thinking? What is the customer's action? Uh, what or where are they uh, doing their buying research? And then how long? Uh, will that customer kind of move along? Yeah, I think one of the important takeaways from this should be that customer journeys are typically mapped out in a linear fashion, right? Yep. But they're not linear at all. Mm -hmm. um, people come and they go and they browse and they add things to shopping carts and they leave or they register for something and they, you know, it, it falls off. And there's a lot of distraction. Um, and and that's important to keep in mind mm -hmm. um, while you're putting all of this stuff together, if yep. that makes sense here. Absolutely. Okay. So we can, I'll pull up that customer journey map in a second here, but let's yep. not get uh, bogged down in it. <laughs> it's all good. No worries. <laughs> so beyond mapping this customer journey and understanding it's a nonlinear process, oh, we've got a couple of... I've got the Lightspeed HQ yep. as well. Okay. So moving right along, one of the next things that we want to take into account are, okay, now, so now where do I get my leads? Like, how do I get people even into this journey? And this is something, um, Sashita, this is your, um, your kind of sweet spot. Yep. So what are some of the types of campaigns, Sashita, that you've seen, um, you know, working really well and, and what are some good ways to craft some of these uh, with a low budget? With Facebook, I think a lead magnet campaign, uh, as we discussed before, I think we have seen really good success with that. Uh, you know, creating a good landing page uh, with uh, clear CTAs uh, mm -hmm. and then offering some value proposition. Um, you know, you can get really quality leads and often these leads do convert uh, when you, you know, follow back with them or, or just, um, yeah, through email campaigns and so on. Mm -hmm. For sure. What about for, um, I know a couple of weeks ago, yeah, I think you and I had a huddle and um, you I was, uh, you're trying to show me how to kind of like target uh, audiences more specifically to demographic areas. Like, um, remember we were trying to target up north and um, I think we had a broader target for the GTA and it just mm -hmm. really wasn't kind of working for us. So instead yeah. we moved uh, our target into up north areas, right? Um, and we got a lot more qualified leads because that's where our, our our leads were most comfortable with kind of entering yeah. the mind stage. With campaigns like lead gen and lead magnet campaigns, I think it's very necessary to keep your audience targeting, your location to targeting as broad as possible. And, you know, once uh, Facebook has, um, you know, through its AI has learned what, what, how, what we are targeting and what kind of audience we want, we can narrow that. But in the beginning, it's very important to keep it as broad as possible. Yeah, yeah. at the beginning, during learning phases, for sure. Um, I think one of the other important things, especially on Facebook, and it's also on Google, when you're, when you're at this point of creating um, a social campaign specifically, because Facebook is, is, I'm convinced, almost entirely dependent on audiences to be very successful and interest targeting. Mm -hmm. So as an example, um, we just did a campaign and I'll, I'll just kind of give the parameters of it. It was for boxing fans. And what we were trying to do is in the first step is build awareness for, um, 
uh, boxing fans and, and MMA, mixed martial arts, so Bellator and UFC fans down in Mexico. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that we learned and we know, one because I'm also a fan, is a lot of these fans are Joe Rogan fans, right? And then you start to you start to look at, okay, they, they're interested, the most obvious in the interest targeting, they're interested in boxing, they're interested in UFC, they're interested in Bellator. They're also interested in Joe Rogan. So what does that then mean? Well, they're probably also interested in Dana White and they're interested in these fighters and they're interested in these groups. And you start to kind of wind it out a little bit and that kind of interest targeting. Um, mm -hmm. So, if, you know, another good example is on social in Canada, we cannot target by um, demographic uh, income indexes, right? Yep. So what does that mean? Okay, well, people in higher bracket incomes may be interested in things more like a Tesla, right? They may be part of Tesla owner groups. They may be interested. I mean, you have to, you, this is where it comes down to understanding your audience and creating that persona, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the more interest targeting that you do that's right then you create content that will engage them so the example i have with this is floyd mayweather is fighting logan paul in an exhibition exhibition boxing match sometime either later this year or early next uh -huh. it's causing a massive controversy in that community because hardcore boxing fans think it's it's you know floyd mayweather is one of the greats this is ridiculous this is embarrassing it's not even worth my time it's just a money grab on the other side of that, you've got Logan Paul fans who are saying, this is amazing. He could possibly be Floyd Mayweather. Who knows? It may happen. May probably not, but wouldn't it be cool if it did? Well, that's a level of, of controversy that's, that that's, it is good to tap into um, because you're not making the statement. You know, you just simply know it exists. And the, the brand awareness around that um, was extremely, extremely powerful because not only did we pay a small amount to Facebook to boost that post to the right audience, because that audience was highly, I mean, to the thousands of reactions, um, highly engaged, the organic algorithm takes over and you don't pay for that once that takes over. So it oh. saves your ad spend, right? Yeah, I think we were all... Uh... I think the, that one night that the, the social team uh, put it a boost on it, it was like... It, it was unreal how, 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 how well it was doing and how engaged people were. Yep. Um, it was definitely uh, something nice to watch for sure. For sure. And then on the, so the other benefit when you're running these Facebook audiences and you have these wins, the important part is to create custom audiences based on people who have interacted with your content. You could do obviously smaller, even in the last 10 days to be more targeted. Um, and then have a follow up for them when you're yep. crafting that. For sure. Okay. Got some good comments here uh, in the chat from the bees. Chad says, it's amazing how much of a difference targeted audiences make. Another reason why understanding your customers is so important. For sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And Miguel has one here. Uh, Miguel says, you have to understand what your audience is hungry to talk about especially if you're looking to develop a relationship with them. Yeah, absolutely, for sure. I mean, if you're sending messages to a targeted audience that, you know, they're not interested in, they've never seen this uh, a product like this before, or um, whether it's related uh, to their interests or not, right? So um, mm -hmm. definitely have to get into their brains and uh, and see where their interests are. And, you know, uh, when they're not looking at, uh, you know, MMA stuff, well, what else are they doing, right? Are they looking at Joe Rogan things? Are they looking at Dana White? Um, all those types of things, yeah, for sure. Yeah, you know, absolutely. And, and again, I think the, um, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk will always say, you know, the one job of marketing is to gain attention. He definitely didn't invent that, but that literally is the job of marketing is mm -hmm. like, do, do you even know who we are? Mm -hmm. um, and we talk a lot about tactics and a lot about this kind of thing, but you know, the reality is, is if, if people don't know who you are, are they ever going to buy from you? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so, so those are some, those are some really good and really powerful uh, tips. A couple of other things, um, and Sashid, I don't know if we've launched these yet, but we are looking at Facebook shops and Instagram shopping as well. That's, that's going to be a hugely important. Uh, yeah, we are working on uh, using Facebook for making like, you know, e-commerce and other kind of offer ads during the holiday season. Mm -hmm. 
Cool. All right. So up next, we want to provide. So now you've got the campaigns flowing traffic into your site. A couple of other just tips on campaigns is really double down on your local community. Um, just this this particular holiday season is going to be very unique that people within communities want to support their local communities and use that to your advantage to increase your sales and your awareness. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, so in terms of irresistible offers, trials, packages, contests, I mean, um, Matt, you've, you've run some contests uh, that have been quite successful. Yep. Um, any tips on, on contesting and what you need to think about there? I think, you know, with contesting, a lot of the times people kind of think of uh, complex uh, contests, you know, like offering maybe uh, a few products here or there, or they're kind of really on the fence about whether or not they should run a contest for sure, right? Um, for example, a couple, uh, I think it was last year around this time, we had a contest for um, uh, for one of our clients and it was a, uh, a free subscription for a year, uh, for their products. And, yeah. you know, it might not have been something that was, uh, costly, um, to the, um, to the client, but, you know, uh, if, if, if you're offering a service, a yearly service for free for people, people from all over are going to want to get in there. Right. Um, and, and, and it was a great way to, to build up a leads list. And, you know, sometimes uh, launching a contest, especially now before the, the, the trip wires, right, mm -hmm. is a great way to kind of just funnel in a bunch of leads and then filter them out throughout um, through like a Black Friday sale or throughout the holidays, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't, like I said, it doesn't have to be anything big. It doesn't have to be anything extravagant, right? But, you know, if you frame it around, you know, um, what your audience is interested in, you know, what they really want, um, people will go for it. And uh, and it's, they turned out quite successful. Absolutely. And you want to make sure that you're capturing, um, you're capturing your, for contests, um, an email registration to, to get in is, yep. is really important because you can start to build on that as well. For sure. Um, yeah. And, and um, not, don't, don't ask for too much information too. I think no. a lot of the times too is people are eager to, you know, get the phone number, get the first name, get their last name, get their, you know, get their address, a, a whole bunch of stuff. Right. But mm -hmm. just keep it simple if you can, right. Maybe a first name, last name and an email. That's a lot to ask from someone for sure. Right. Especially if they've never seen your business, uh, never seen your brand or anything like that. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely if it's a first step and it's a, it's, you know, um, Top of funnel, definitely keep it simple. Uh, don't don't go too overboard. Absolutely, um, yeah. Keeping it simple uh, and keeping it uh, rapid in terms of contesting, um, micro contests can be more effective because everybody likes to win something. Mm -hmm. um, and contests with uh, social conscience. So you know, enter the contest, and for every ballot, we will donate one dollar to the local food bank or your, you know, whatever whatever your local charity of choice might be. Mm -hmm. Is another great way to do it. Um, in terms of packages, we talked about this before, and Sashita, you mentioned landing pages as well. Yeah. Um, build out a bundled landing page that's specific that goes direct to that purchase if you're on an e-commerce store to reduce the friction and use those informational upsells to provide value so people feel like they're getting a lot more uh, than just the physical single product. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of you know, getting those packages put together and having everything the next key here, and this, this one could not be reinforced enough, all of the most successful companies in the world, um, everybody from Apple and Google, all the way down to, um, to, to much smaller businesses, have a very strong email lead and customer list. It's literally, you can make or break a business online based on having this or, or uh, you know, I've actually seen some e-commerce uh, retailers that, that really, they, they have a list, but they don't. Like they've mm -hmm. never emailed and they're wondering why they're struggling. Well, because every time you want to go out, you're one, you're paying the big um, networks to get contact attention and you're not nurturing your investments in those email lists. And there are some some big marketers out there that can literally send out uh, an email campaign to a specific list and make hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah. 
Absolutely. So build that list. That's for sure. Okay. Leveraging FOMO. Yeah, and this this goes well with the contests too, right? I mean, um, if if you pair, you know, a sense of, of a, a time sensitive contest that you know it's it's maybe running for the week, right? Um, people are gonna have a fear of missing out. People are gonna want to enter that contest and make sure that they're not gonna miss out on that prize, right? So um, that's a that's actually a really good tie in uh, to this uh, this topic right here. Yeah, for sure. And leveraging fear of missing out does not necessarily always mean a timer. It could be limited availability. You mm -hmm. know, like you really want, uh, it could be a drop. So a special type of product that will only be available for this amount of time and, and probably no more. Um, but definitely working that into your engagement strategy. Again, what we're trying to do is we're trying to turn people that are visiting your site for whatever reason into either a lead or a buyer. Like that's the ultimate goal here. So, you know, that sense of urgency, you see it everywhere around you and you have to make sure that that is implemented as part of your overall strategy. Mm -hmm. For sure. Cool. Um, last but not least, as we approach 5 p.m. Oh, here we go. It's got a couple of good ones here. Stacey's got a huge one. We've literally covered up. Oh, that's a bond. <laughs> We've literally covered up Sashida's face with this one. <laughs> Offer trials and contests are great, but you have to make sure you've warmed up your audience, make them feel welcome, and hit them with a surprise. Yes. Mm -hmm. Consumers are surfing through social channels, don't want to deal with something complicated. They want to enter and then move on. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, the, I think one of the important things that you said there, Yvonne, is warming that audience, like continually warming up that audience and continually staying in touch with them. Um, don't underestimate uh, the power of uh, community for sure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, April saying content just a great way to build a relationship with new consumers and have them get to know you and your company. Um, mm -hmm. Get them interested and excited about your brand, especially around the holiday season. Yes, absolutely. One of the things we talked about last week, and I think it's really important, especially for smaller businesses, is tell your story. You know, yep. flip open your camera tell the story about your business, how you started it, why you started it, what what you're passionate about, you know, what your uh, fears are, what you're looking forward to, how you're surviving the coronavirus, all those fun things. That yeah, for sure. Builds. That's why guys like Gary Vaynerchuk are so popular. If you listen mm -hmm. and watch videos, mm -hmm. he's just telling a story. Yep. He's also Absolutely. able to, yeah, he's also able to create a ton of content because all he does is have someone film him while he's in meetings. <laughs> He has a full team just churning out the content for him. It's nuts. Everything yeah. he does, it's like you got a 15 second video and you're good to go. Yeah, it's for nuts. sure. One thing I will say about Yvonne's uh, comment that really stuck out is, you know, customers surfing through social channels, they don't really want to deal with something complicated too. So, right. So if you have a mm -hmm. lead gen form or something like that, and a lot of the times people like to go to the landing page to kind of get their forms filled out and everything like that. But we've actually had success, Sashida, or you've had success with, you know, native uh, lead gen forms on Facebook, right? Where people don't have to go somewhere else. They don't have to click to landing page and they can just fill it out right there on Facebook, right? Um, yeah. So a lot of the times that's, that's an extra step that you can take away and people actually like that more. For sure. And these Legion uh, campaigns, they are like mobile optimized. And since most of our traffic is, you know, coming through mobile, it's it's very easier to capture these leads. And even for the leads, like they don't have to manually enter their information since Facebook already has so much of their information. Yeah. It already pre-fills the information, those fields for them. And I think, you know, that also, st you know, saves the users. It makes them very easier, I guess, you know, instead of manually filling out all your details and everything. So mm -hmm. yeah, those that's, kind of campaigns really work. Yeah, that's a that's a great tip, and and also I think that there might be that uh, that temptation to add more in, um, to add more information to those Facebook lead gen forms, but at a certain point, you're forcing someone to do the opposite, which is now fill things in. Yeah. Right. Yeah. For sure. Sure. Um, let's move on to our last point here because we're it's actually at five o'clock, but. This one's super important um, and implementing engagement tools. Mm -hmm. And um, Matt, I threw I threw a, an article into the chat there. I just randomly kind of pulled it up. Yeah. Last comment. Yep. Mm -hmm. So th this article, while Matt cues that up, is about um, and it's actually quite famous about Apple's customer experience strategy and and 
this is something I would I would challenge everybody with a website to try to do. Whether again, it doesn't matter if it's e-commerce or B two B or whatever you're trying to do. So Apple's strategy, if you've been to an Apple store, was a real take away uh, from the norm. They really went out into left field and said, why are stores designed the way stores are designed with a, you know, there's a checkout at the front and, you know, that's all it's, these are strategies that have not been updated in years. Like, why do you even have to go to a checkout, for example? Right. So their strategy was to turn um, every store into a town hall where you would hang out like a town square where, so you don't think of it as a store. Apple doesn't. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, what I'm challenging you to do as a business owner is don't simply treat your store like an e-commerce store, create an experience out of it. So when someone visits that store, they can consume video, they can um, learn about your story. You've got a chat bot, you've got the ability to live chat, you've got mm -hmm. lots of interactive tools beyond just simply, oh, there's my product and there's the checkout and please yep. come again. Right. Um, yeah. And the, and, and the, the, the visual, I think at the top says a lot, a lot about. Yeah, for sure. And yeah. I think, I think it's more so too, like, you know, um, having that town square quarter sort of feel, but also like Apple does a really good job of using their stores as an education center as well, mm -hmm. right. For products, you know, when someone buys a product, they take the time to sit down, unbox it with you, go through all the steps with everything, show you some cool tricks that you can do with it. And I think it's really important for people, you know, create a, uh, whether it's an e-commerce store or, or a physical store, right? Create an educational center where, you know, you can take the time and maybe uh, have a few articles in there for people to kind of read through some really easy videos that maybe you put together and showcase your product, some tutorials. Mm -hmm. um, things like that really kind of create more atmosphere on your store and encourage people to return, come back or stay on your store for a little bit longer, right? Mm -hmm. After you make that sale, someone leaves your, your store and you don't see them until the next, uh, the next purchase cycle, right? Um, think of ways to kind of keep coming to, for them to keep coming to your store, right? And I think an education center is a, is a really good way to do that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. Um, so Sashita, uh, just on the on the social and search campaigns, we touched on a bunch of strategies and tips for people to help set up and, and do the right things. Do you have anything else and any ideas, just tips in general when you're spending money on ad campaigns that might be helpful for people? Yeah, for sure. So I think um, uh, to generate the right leads, I think closely monitoring your campaigns uh, is very important. Like you cannot just set the campaign and forget about it. Closely monitoring those um, campaigns and making the necessary optimizations may be in bit changes or uh, you know just update the ads copy a bit um, you no know, depending on the performance of the campaign in the last few days it definitely uh, helps you to improve the performance of mm -hmm. and the quality of the leads okay yeah that's that's great advice too and i think that the one last thing i would add to that is do not be afraid to fail and pivot and change right yep. um and and like test, 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 test different types of images. Um, I believe with some of our webinar promotions, and correct me if I'm wrong, Sashita, but when we added images of the hosts and the presenters looking directly, uh, you know, at what would be the viewer, uh, there was an increase in those conversions. Was that? Would yes, that that's for sure. Like people, they kind of connect or it's more of a personalized messaging and images for those kind of campaigns. And we did see a lot of, uh, you know, success with those images than just the stock images or just a webinar topic related images. For Fantastic. Sure. Fantastic. All right, everybody. Well, it's 5.04. Um, thank you, Sashida. Thank you, producer Matt. Yeah. Um, it's going to be a normal week next week because this short week stuff is just a killer. Yeah, <laughs> always is, always is. And then, you know, there's American Thanksgiving coming up soon. And, you know, that's always fun, too. I think right now, this time of year, it's 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 the busiest time of year, you know. Um, but you have less days, too, because of all the holidays. So it's really like it's, it's crunch hours for sure, right? So, yeah. 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 Uh, Sashida, you got anything exciting you're doing this weekend? Uh, not much. Now we, we, we will be having our festivities very soon. Yeah. yeah a lot of, so yeah, prepping up for those. Okay. Good stuff. Nice. Right How about you, Matt? Uh, I'm going to be studying this weekend, doing a little bit of work, um, you know, the student life stuff. So 
yeah. yeah. Not too exciting. So, what about you? Good stuff. I'm going to catch up on some work a little bit um, and uh, just try to get everything ready for the first snowfall. Yeah. Kind of deal. Uh, I don't want to be caught unawares or behind on that because it's <laughs> never fun to be trying to move furniture in the snow and stuff like that. I know. I know. I can't believe we're, we're thinking about snow. But even now, like, we're, we're starting to get to the time where the sun's going down at like four o'clock. Like, look at my room. My room's like way darker than it was when we first started the live. Yeah. It's like, oh my God. Yeah. It's the season. It's nuts. Two yeah. weeks, two weeks until, uh, yep, two weeks until daylight savings time. Yeah. Well, really they, they, they were talking about cl- shutting that down, eh? Yeah, I read that too. Yeah. They, I I've think been... it's Ontario proposed it, and I think there's three American states that have to say okay to it for mm-hmm. it to go through. I'm all for it, but then it would be really messed up if like half the provinces didn't. Yeah. They like break time zones in half. I don't know. Kids, kids aren't working the crops in the fields anymore like they did 100 years ago. So do we really need this? <laughs> I mean, maybe there are kids. I shouldn't actually say that, but I don't know. That's Not as true. many, for sure. Yeah. Not as many. That's that's absolutely. April said shut it down. I hate daylight savings. It's daylight I don't know, saving. It's daylight saving. You know, you don't hate saving. it when you get the extra hour to sleep in, right? You don't hate it yeah. when you get the extra hour. It's that hour that's taken away from you, right? <laughs> It's a fallacy. It's not an extra hour. <laughs> it makes you feel like it. Anyways, yeah. we don't need to get into this hot, hot button contentious issue. All right, everybody. Well, thanks a lot. And we will see you next Friday, same bat time, same bat channel for episode 153 of Live at the Hive. See you guys then. <laughs> see you.